experience before. It's easier that way. Well, we haven't adopted that in the committee, with due respect, uh, Minister. Thanks for that. And thanks for your input and the department's input. If it's, the a members it's, a that, suggestion. it's a suggestion. No, no, I understand, except that it over-party politicizes it, but then I'm cool. If people want that, do people want that? Are they fine with that, or would we go to normal routine? No, let's go normal. Let's go normal, sir. All right, so you first, Zola. Right, number one, who's number two? Dutoy is number two. Dion George is number three, from what I see here. Who's yes, next? Yes. Um, who's next? Mr. 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 Vessels. Four. Mr. Njatu. Five. Anybody else? Yes, Chief. Mr. Tutoit. Yeah, he's number two, yo. Okay. Okay, for now, let's take Zola. Three minutes. I'm going to go to you on the cell phone, right? Sorry, who else? Dennis Joseph. All right, there you are. Okay, Joseph. That's seven, right? So you know your numbering. I don't want to intervene unduly, so can we flow from one to the other? I'll just let you know 30 seconds before your time's up. So who's going first, Zola? You're on three minutes, thanks. Yes, thanks, Chairperson. I will take far less than the minutes that you have given. Good. Chair, because one, <clears throat> I concur with the minister that uh, whilst you are talking about this, there is the medium-term budget statement that is coming in October. <clears throat> And uh, he has actually taken us to confidence uh, regarding this that is presented today. Just one question, Chair. For the sake of easing the tensions around the country, Minister, uh, we, we understand the, the overstretchedness uh, and the pinch that government is actually experiencing. Now, on borrowing for funding, versus a government's state fastness on the RSA policy. Uh, you get me, Minister. I don't mind wherever you go for borrowing, but won't this affect uh, the South African policies? This is in particular relation to the IMF <coughs> specifically. Thanks, Chairperson. Thank you. Next, number two, please. I see there's also Floyd, uh, Depoer, Jordan, and uh, Vusi after that. Yes, go ahead, number two. Thank you, uh, Chair. Uh, Minister, you mentioned that government's current borrowing activities will make it difficult for private investment. Uh, currently, government is not in a position to effectively handle the challenges of the economy. My question is, would the minister say that it was wise to focus on radical economic transformation rather than on stimulating the economical growth from the country. Number three, please. Um, thanks very much, Chairperson. Um, well, certainly the picture does not inspire very much confidence. I mean, we're in very deep trouble, and anybody who thinks that we aren't is really not understanding the problem. But what I want to know is, obviously, we're going to borrow. But I think it's very important that we get some insights into what the what the conditions are going to be for the borrowing. I mean, obviously, the IMF and the World Bank are not going to give us any money without demanding structural reform. Now, we know we do need structural reform, but we certainly need to know what that is going to be. And radical economic transformation isn't one of them. Also, this situation is making people incredibly nervous, um, especially people with, with their pension funds. They are concerned that government is going to tap their pension funds to fill this massive big hole that has been created by long-term mismanagement of the economy and now COVID. So um, I would like the minister to give us an assurance that government will not do that. And then also, um, finally, um, the Reserve Bank was mentioned. Now, obviously, it's not the domain of, of government really to interfere in monetary policy, but also, that's making people very, very uh, concerned, especially utterances that have been made by the deputy minister about printing money. Now, obviously, that's not a good idea. But we would also like to get some assurance from the minister that there's not going to be interference in monetary policy. There's not going to be pressure on the Reserve Bank to print more money or issue more bond bonds, with, which, which is actually the same thing, other than to stabilize um, the bond market if the Reserve Bank is going to work in that field. Thanks very much, Chair. Nick, please. Lubabala, who's next? I think it's Mr. 
Mr. Vassal, step in if I'm not mistaken. Right, voter? Thank you, Chair. I thought I'm number five, but maybe I can't count. Um, sorry about that. Uh, Chairperson, thank you. And thank you uh, to the to Treasury for the presentation as well. Um, we are in trouble, and uh, I think, uh, yeah, it's it's there's no doubt that uh, the minister very clearly yesterday indicated how deep in trouble we are. But the question remains, even after the minister. Um, did announce or did uh, paint that picture as to what the plan of government is to get out of this. And one of the biggest questions is what is going to be done with regards to the public wage bill? Um, we didn't hear any clear indication with regards to that. We know that the unions have already indicated that they are not going to accept um, the proposals in that regard. And uh, what is the plan with regards to that? I want to echo what uh, Mr. George also said in terms of the structural reforms. Mm -hmm. But to add to that, I think we need policy certainty. And what, what happened with regards to National Treasury's policy paper, which proposed certain um, reforms? Um, it's, it's as if that paper disappeared now and it's dormant. And we actually need a lot of those proposals now. And then lastly, Chairperson, with regards to South African Airways, um, and it was mentioned now in the presentation as well with regards to government guarantees. And the problem that we have is what will happen if South African Airways now completely fails and it's liquidated? Um, that will obviously um, put much more pressure on uh, government debt. And is Treasury also involved in this process and also taking, um, this, this, uh, taking this into account and the impact that this will have? Um, and really lastly, Chair, the 100 billion rand that was announced for job creation, uh, if it can just be explained, what will that entail? What is that money for and how is it going to create jobs? Thank you. Next, please. Lubavalo, help, please. Njatu, Mr. Njatu. I think it's, it's Mr. Njatu. After Mr. Njatu, it's Mr. Shivambo. Yeah, Pipoa, Jordan, and then Vusi, and then, oh, yes, it's Floyd again. Well, yeah. Please, Mr. Njatu. I think we've lost him, have we? Okay, Floyd, why don't you go ahead and mean what? Have you forgotten okay. about me, Chairperson? Who's that? According to the sequence, you're after, you're after Floyd. Okay. Tipo? Okay. But it doesn't really matter. I mean, really, does it? Yeah, okay, who wants to go? Uh, uh, thanks, Chair. Can I I'm proceed? Yeah, yeah, please do. No, thanks, Chairperson. Just quick observations is that uh, before the outbreak of COVID-19, South Africa was in the so-called uh, technical recession with the last two quarters of 2019 having experienced negative growth of 0 0.8 in the third, the third quarter and 1.4% in the last quarter of 2019. And the minister has been the minister since 2018 and uh, has been pursuing a, a wild goose chase like through orthodox economic policies. I'm, I'm yet to hear a believable and coherent plan in terms of how does national treasury under the current minister uh, intend to utilize fiscal policy to stimulate domestic economic activity that will lead to growth later on because even what has been presented now doesn't begin to give us clarity of how are we going to realize growth, how are we going to create jobs in South Africa. These just repetitions of classical orthodox economics, which do not find relevance in the South African context now. That is one. Number two, uh, I don't know why both the minister and the president of the public keep on saying 500 billion injection, 500 billion stimulus package and everything else there. 
Well, the biggest expenditure item in that 500 billion is 200 billion, which is loan guarantees to businesses that must still go to commercial banks. And if we were to ask the ministry now to give us who are the applicants and who has received those guarantees from commercial loans, we have received the loans and therefore guarantees from government, you, you will check that we must be given a racial composition of who are the people who got that? And the, the likelihood is that some might not get, and you know who will not get in terms of the racial composition and participation in South African economy, that a lot of black people will obviously be excluded for obvious reasons. That is why the courts have reaffirmed the centrality of dealing with the national question when we are dealing with developmental issues. But also part of that 500 billion is 70 billion on tax deferments. It's not like it's an immediate intervention that uh, is coming from government as a fiscal injection into a crisis. And also it's 40 billion rand monies of workers which they've deposited to the unemployment insurance fund and are now withdrawing because there's a crisis. Because if you want to claim everything else now, it means that in the future, when we claim our monies from the pension funds, you are going to say, no, government has helped you or government has made an intervention in your life or in the economy by giving you the money which is due to you because in any way you had made that a, a contribution a, during the period when you were. So this 500 billion is just over hype, a, 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 a politicization of something which is not 500 billion. Oh, can, three, 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 three. That, yeah. can you yeah, round that, up? That, Come back to you. The, yeah. the, two, two, two quick issues. One is that I don't think that we have exhausted domestic fiscal and monetary policy options to could have the deficit. And they seem to be just overzealousness to go to the IMF, which definitely is going to compromise our sovereignty. That is a given. You don't even need to ask anyone. There's no negotiation which is going to change the attitude and conditionalities of the IMF. The last question that I want to then deal with is the issue of this zero-based budgeting, which is a method in which all expenses must be justified for each new period. And in the sort of context, you have got obligations which you cannot move away from in terms of budgeting. You can't move away from the commitments on social grants. You can't move away from the commitments on health care, on, on education, on, on safety and security. You can't move away from that. So I don't understand this context of zero-based budgeting. Maybe it's just another phrase, Mongari, which is being introduced Lord, as a measure to right. achieve. Those right. right. images right. which were rejected when we dealt with the... Right. the Look technology. at the screen. You're at 4.22. Yeah, okay, not fair. Anybody else who wants to speak up to 4.22, you're entitled to, to be fair. Right, Dennis, we forgot you. Let me come into yeah. Jimbo. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Chairperson. Thank you to the Minister and, and the team. Um, just got four questions. Um, on slide 15, I just would like to, uh, about, it's about the VAT, the value added tax. I want the Minister to tell the Minister of Cocktail and the Minister of Health, because we, are, we, are, we, we, are, we have a shortage of tax on VAT. Please tell the two Ministers that people is allowed to smoke, or maybe I should say people are not allowed to smoke, and not allowed to pay tax legally, but there are many people who smoke illegally and they pay these higher prices to the cigarettes. So the, the people are smoking, whether there's a ban on it, that's the point I'm making. They've gone past the area the, the, the area of, of not having it, they now have it and they get it illegally and they pay that money to whatever the price is. In the meantime, we are suffering value added tax. Then on slide 27, the debt outlook, uh, how to stabilize. would like to know by when. That plan is very good from 81 80 down to 73. Uh, it's, it looks a very good plan. We would like to know by when. And then slide 29, uh, Treasury keeps on reminding us about the reforms and the rationalization. I would like to know what is the time frame, where does it sit with Cabinet or with National Treasury, who's in charge of the project because we can in six months from now, say the same things or hear the same thing from Treasury. They're giving us the signals. We as politicians or members must drive, also make sure the project is driven. And then the last point on the recapitalization of the land bank, the three billion, I do understand, but I want to ask Treasury, rationalization between the land bank itself and agriculture maybe must also investigate it because there's a lot of maybe overlaps. 
uh, between the two um, the divisions, the SOE and the department itself, on programs that should be investigated. Thank you, um, Chairperson. Okay, it's Depo and then it's Vusi. Thank you, thank you very much, Chairperson, and thank you to the Minister as well as the DJ and team for the presentation. Minister, I would like to ask you a question that I know you have answered many times, but I still want to ask it. And it is the issue related to the debt service cost, which is escalating at the rate at which you and your team have indicated that by 2024, it will be higher than the health budget. And I would want to know what is the overall plan that uh, we have in place to deal with this particular uh, challenge, and is um, is the is the buy-in from all stakeholders to the plan that probably national treasury would be having. On slide 13, Minister, there's an indication that commercial banks have got a 90 days uh, debt relief. I want to say, Minister, this is probably the a, a lie to the to 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 uh, bondholders and loan uh, holders of. Uh, uh, commercial banks, because it's a mockery to say to people that take for 90 days you don't pay, but we as the bank will continue uh, increasing the, the 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 debt service cost because it is a debt service cost for the interest to be kept in place. So it is important that we understand that this is further creating problems for households and individuals. Thirdly, a, a minister, is there any chance, uh, I know that this question might not necessarily be belonging to National Treasury, but it does have serious financial implications. Is there any chance that uh, for health workers and education uh, uh, practitioners like educators who have got, who are above 55 years, have comorbidities, who are, are now affected by this uh, COVID-19, to introduce some kind of VSP for them because I know that with teachers probably you can work remotely, you can work from home, but with nurses it's not possible for them to work from home. So it is important that we 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 we, we get to know because in our constituencies we get to be asked these particular questions, especially with health workers uh, being infected at the rate that they are, and uh, some even in the Western Cape there's one who died the day before her retirement date. The, 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 the last one, Minister, I think it was raised by one of the colleagues with regard to the wage bill, and I would leave it there. Uh, I forgot, I must apologize. Uh, Jordan's next, and then it's uh, Vusi. Sorry about that, Jordan. No problem, Chairperson. Uh, thank you very much, Minister, and your team. Thank you, Raphael, uh, you uh, a very good you, presentation you. that really does fill one with confidence that we that we have a fighting chance to avoid the jaws of that uh, hippopotamus uh, when one listens to the thoroughness and the and the uh, the detail of this presentation i've i've been in these long question sessions before and what tends to happen is that the minister gives a very general response because there's so many questions so i just want to focus on some very specific questions so that i can get some very specific answers i want to start before the crisis the the DG, I think it was, or, or the, the one of his colleagues said that we came into this crisis lacking in uh, fiscal buffers. I just want to ask who who bears ultimate responsibility for the lack of fiscal buffers going into a crisis? Uh, if not the Treasury, the Treasury is responsible for for the nation's finances, and uh, it's it's a it's an odd statement to say that that we came into this crisis with no fiscal buffers coming from the Treasury. So who bears responsibility? Who's accountable for that? Minister, if you could just tell us, please, very specifically, what was cut out of your speech yesterday on Regulation 28? You said in your press conference that something was cut out of the speech. I'd like to know uh, what it was, please. Then, very importantly, you said in your speech that the cabinet had committed to achieving primary balance by 23-24. What is the nature of that commitment? Is it a commitment in the sense of we will do whatever it takes to deliver that outcome? Or is it a commitment like many of the other commitments we've had, commitments to economic reform, for example, which means we'll try our best, but really no promises? 
Because what South Africa needs is a whatever it takes commitment from cabinet to achieve primary balance. Uh, but it can't just be a best effort. It has to be a, a real meaningful commitment. I wonder, Minister, if you could please express yourself. What is your view on the proposed rescue uh, business rescue package uh, for South African Airways, which requires 16 billion rand in the in the current year and 33 billion rand over the MTF? Uh, I presume, from the lack of any figure related to SAA in your speech yesterday, that that says something about your position. But I would like it clear and on the record, please. Then uh, early on in this crisis, the president announced a hundred billion rand of uh, allocation to job creation. You repeated that yesterday, but this is very thin on detail. Could you please take us through exactly how that money is going to be spent? Because on the face of it, it looks like a simple rebranding of existing spending from EPWP and other public works programs. And then finally, you painted this picture of these two scenarios, an active scenario, the, the, the narrow gate that you quoted from the Bible, and the, the wide gate uh, to bankruptcy and ruin. And you pinned all your hopes and your plan for debt stabilization on an active scenario, the narrow gate. But I just want to ask whether you concede that that, that plan, the active scenario, relies on the fact not just of a return to fiscal discipline and getting debt under control, but also growth reforms from the rest of the government. And that therefore the active scenario is far from the base case. It's far from guaranteed. Indeed, it, if one looks at the previous evidence on reform, there's been very little progress to speak of to date. Do you think it's overly optimistic to, to tell the country and the world that the active scenario is your base case. And you're at four minutes. Surely, right? you, must, yeah. surely you must concede that a uh, a passive scenario based on the available evidence at this stage is frankly more likely. Your comment on that, please, and thank you, Chairperson. All right, just to get a sequence going, now that we've had three different ways of reaching me, it's Injadu who's now reconnected with us, Busi, Divet, Skozana's withdrawn now, Alkamp, Mapena, and a Shabalala. Is that correct? And somebody's withdrawn. Is that Skozana? Okay, go for it. You know the sequence. You want to help me with that so we don't uh, veer away from it. I think we should draw to a close with this and allow the minister and team to respond and then we can come back. So that's the order. Injadu, Busi, Divet, Skozana, Alkamp, Mapena, Shabalala. Thank you. Oh, Skozana's right. withdrawn. Right, go for it. Uh, next is Injadu. Are you back, Injadu? No, he left that game, Chair. You can right, skip him. Busi, I see him on the screen. Yes, go ahead, Busi. No, no, thank you very much, uh, Honorable Chair. And uh, let's appreciate the supplementary budget, which has been set by the Minister. Just a quick one. Uh, I just want to understand the, the debt that we have currently, which, uh, in my understanding, is just going to affect our large portion of the entire bigger chunk of our budget. So I would actually want to understand uh, in terms of the monetary value, you know, uh, when we talk about the repayment of these debts, uh, what actually are we talking about uh, in terms of that? And secondly, there was this issue of an NHI, which in my understanding, uh, it was actually, or it's simply going to make more services uh, affordable since government will be a sole uh, purchaser of the health services. Now, I, I heard that uh, it has been suspended in terms of its own activity. So I would actually want to understand uh, how that they came about it. And the last chair, because some of the members have already spoken about the issues. In terms of the budget, they, they were talking about the balances to provinces which is going to be heavily changed. So can we also get clarity on that and understand again uh, how our budget is going to affect our township economy? Because apparently since this COVID-19, things have been abnormal. So it will also be good for us to understand how it's going to, to, to be carried out. And thank you very much. Thank you, Divet. Thank you, Mr. Chairperson, honorable members. I've got a question to the Honourable Minister. Uh, in regards to the 3 billion 
that was allocated to the land bank. How is it possible to still finance the land bank when they mentioned earlier that they borrow funds at a higher rate and then lent us out at a reduced rate? This is almost like we're compiling the problems and only postponing the financial distress of this SOE. Thank you very much, Mr. Minister. Honorable Minister, thank you. Thank you. Next is Willie Alcom. Willie, thank are you still connected? Yeah, okay, go for it. Thank you, thank you, Honorable Chair. I have been covered. We can carry on. Ah, okay. That means you can open more space for Floyd, but fine. Uh, <laughs> uh, th thank you, thank you, Honorable Chair. On behalf of local government, Chair, we welcome the presentation of the budget. But we have a few challenges. There are three in this regard. One is a decline in revenue that is there uh, based on the collection rate of municipalities, uh, which ranges between 35% and 56% of revenue collection. The second one is the issue of the suspension of conditional grants uh, to the tune of 10.7 billion, which, if it's implemented, will ensure will will inhibit the implementation of projects. The third one is the issue of the multi-year wage settlement. Uh, the minister understands that local government uh, favors a multi-year uh, uh, wage settlement so that we, we might have stability. But if we go the route that is in the public domain of not going the bargaining council, we face a scenario where labor might not want to go into a multi-year. We understand the difficulty that the minister is facing. Uh, and then we'd like to make the following suggestions or recommendations to the minister. The first one is the, the view that uh, Salga has on the under recovery as a basis for allocation should take into consideration overall sector, not just metros, because we've seen that metros are, are favored above other, uh, other municipalities. And again, we'd like the minister to have an agent review of the fiscal reform for local government over and above addressing only the COVID related issues. The local government expenditure uh, sh uh, uh, shares formula to portray realistic cost differences in municipalities so that we can address the underfunding of local government. The last one is that the upcoming uh, October 20th adjustment budget must consider the impact of the real reduction in the municipal revenues and the impact this may have on the local government sector in response to COVID uh, related service delivery issues. Thank you, Honorable Chair. Colleague Shabalala, please. Are you still connected? Unmute your mic, please. I'm afraid I, I think the person's not connected. Is that right, Dubabal? Can you help me? He's connected, chair. Sorry? He's connected. I think it's just a network problem. All right, we can come back to him. And if okay. I'm correct. Can I stop? Sorry, are you connected, Mr. Shabalal? No, I just Sorry. wanted to check if I can just throw in one question. I no, of course, you can. Yes, please do. Yes. No, thank you, Chairperson. Uh, let me also appreciate the presentation by the minister and the DG, as well as the colleagues from Treasury. I just want to ask a, a very straightforward question uh, to the minister and the team. Uh, is this not an opportune time, perhaps, to establish that state bank that the ANC had asked for. I'm a little bit concerned with the fact that these huge amounts of money are only, the, they, they, they benefit in the banking sector in the main, the private banks, and they are profiting. And I think it would be great if maybe we can use this window period to establish this state bank so that as we go out there to borrow and get more money elsewhere, uh, this money uh, uh, helps us also to fund some of the things that we wanted to realize some time ago. And um, the, the, the other question uh, that is of great interest to me is to check with the minister if the IMF is actually our first option. You know, I grew up when I was a young person knowing the IMF as one of the ruthless instruments of imperialism. And it would be great if I can hear from the minister what would be the terms and conditions for the money that we will get from the IMF. Perhaps there was no way that we could look at other options other than the IMF. I really don't like that institution unless it has transformed, of which I've not heard in the recent uh, past. 
uh, those are the two questions, Jefferson. Thanks for the opportunity. Thank you. Uh, is there anybody else we left out? Is Mr. Shabalala back? No? Anybody we left out? Anybody not? Mr. Mr. Njadu is back, Chair. Ah. Okay, go for it, Mr. Njadu. Yeah, he often has problems eh, in our other committee meetings as well. So when he comes back, we'll obviously include him. I also have three minutes. Uh, the chair, co-chairs will, Dick Lady and, and Joe, will come in. Perhaps I'll come in at the end. For now, I think everybody's been included. We've, uh, I don't think there's anybody left out. Maybe Floyd and Jordan only, but the rest have all been included. All right, let's go for uh, uh, the minister and the DG and the department to respond to the questions. Minister, there's an appeal to be precise and specific to the very precise questions asked. Thank you. What do you mean by that? Precisely what I said, which is that, you know, the problem... Are, with the are, are, you, are you suggesting that I'm usually not precise? No, no, no. It's a system that I have a problem with, but this is what we stuck with, which is ask too many questions. It becomes a shopping list. No minister. I have a competent, right? And you are no, very technically competent. You must You've be very careful. You no. must be very careful no, 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 about any undertone. No, 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 there's no undertone except what you see in it. Can we please move on? Well, that's what you said. You said you must... oh, yeah, yeah. No, but it has happened before in the scoff period when I chaired. I'm clear about that, but we can agree to disagree, Chair. No, but Minister... remember, I'm also a member of parliament. But anyway, let's leave that aside. <clears throat> the uh, Thank you very much, uh, honorable members, for your, your questions and your so contributions. I know that uh, the honorable member from the DA complained that I normally give a comprehensive answer and not specific to each question. I'm afraid I will disappoint a bit also this evening. I'll give a, a hybrid system of responses, i.e. I'll be specific in some cases, but also broad in others because they're all sort of related. I want to start with the last question um, because, you know, in a sense, it's very important because there are many in our society who um, want to work with us in understanding the uh, funding mechanism you know, of the national budget. So we have. Uh, priorities that we set out in the budget, we uh, cost them, we know how much we should uh, budget for them. We have a revenue base from our tax system. Then we have a funding gap because what we want to achieve in our priorities costs more than the revenue that we have. And then we have to start financing the gap. Where do we finance the gap from? Uh, very briefly, we finance it from domestic borrowings. We issue treasury bills. We issue inflation-linked bonds. We do all kinds of things like that. Then that's not enough. Then we issue global bonds, international bonds, as is there in in the uh, book review and in the budget review that uh, we had. We issue once a year specific uh, specific number of uh, global bonds, then maybe the market might not be enough for that, or the market might be more expensive for us. Then we have to look to uh, international development finance institutions, BRICS Bank, IMF, well, World Bank, also IMF, African Development Bank, maybe in some instances, other sort of bilateral uh, institutions. Now, in this particular instance, we have sought to approach the BRICS Bank, the IMF, the World Bank, the African Development Bank, to supplement what we need in this COVID environment. Now, the International Monetary Fund. The International Monetary Fund is a, has been historically a difficult institution. And amongst the uh, progressive left, the IMF has always been seen as a problematic institution. And I agree with that because in the 1970s and 80s, 
some of the conditionalities that the IMF put in place put many countries, many developing countries, into serious difficulties. I can tell this committee that I have been a member of an international committee that evaluated the IMF funding, funding situation and their approach and made recommendations on how they should behave themselves going into the future. And I can tell you for certain that in this instance, the 4.2 billion rand that we are, uh, dollars that we are applying for is not one based on conditionalities. But we have to demonstrate that we are in a position to pay back that which we are going to borrow from the fund. So I thought I should say something about that. But we are pro approaching, as I said, the BRICS Bank, where we are a member. We are approaching the IMF, where we are a member, a fully paid member. We are approaching the uh, World Bank. We are approaching the, 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 the uh, African Development Bank as well. So I thought just to make that clear. And we'll try all we can to make sure that we get the best, best possible deal. On the State Bank, I think the Honorable Member makes a very good point, actually, that uh, um, if we had a State Bank or a system of State Banks in place, these would have come in very handy at the moment when we need, for example, the credit uh, guarantee scheme. I, I, I fully agree with that. But I want to bring to the attention of the member that we actually have many state banks in South Africa already. Many. Itala, uh, the Popo Development Corporation, uh, IDC for Agriculture, Land Bank, blah, blah, blah. We've got lots of them. The key question is whether they have been able to fulfill their mandate to the best. And I think, Chair, I could ask you maybe to schedule a special conversation in future about this state bank issue. And Deputy Masondo is on the line. He might wish to say something. But let me indicate to you that you actually have another quasi state bank in place. Sorry, 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 sorry Chairperson. I think. Sorry, what's I, that? I, on a point of order, when, when, when we speak about the state bank, we're talking about the bank as recognized by the Banks Act, not, not those financial institutions, none of yeah, those. Right, right. You can come back now. That's not a point of order. Now, that's not a point of order, Floyd, as you well know. Minister, go ahead. You can come back. I think there's plenty of time, to be fair. Right. Floyd can come back. No problem. That's a debate. That's not a point of order, Minister, as you and everybody will acknowledge. Go ahead. Sorry, Mr. Minister. No, I said that maybe we could come back at some at some point. Yes, indeed. That's what I'm going to propose. I, I did, it's I a did, useful proposal. I did, I did say that. I did say that. Quite, quite. Uh, but I also I did say that we do have at the moment a quasi state bank, and it's called the African Bank. Um, so when we come back and debate this issue, and when Floyd has his ears open and he can listen, you can hear what. Uh, I'm going to say at that point, and not uh, any infantile disorder. So they, let me come back to, uh, uh, in all fairness, uh, the first question, uh, which was about borrowing from the IMF. I think I partially dealt with that, uh, Mr. Chairman. It was the first question in the... Uh, yeah, and you've dealt with it on a myriad of occasions. That's correct. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. The next question was from Mr. Didoy, uh, who talked about radical economic transformation and economic growth. I don't know what the point was being made there. I think he was trying to score, score a political point. But the key issue is we have to marshal all the forces that we can, private, public, cooperative, uh, uh, wherever we can get, and construction, mining, transport, logistics, um, uh, wherever. We must marshal all these forces for economic growth. And I think we could do much better instead of trying to cause confusion uh, by calling people radical economic growth, um, transformation, or whatever. So 
but it's okay. Uh, when I'm in Cape Town, we can debate this. Um, the terms, next question was about the terms of borrowing and the debate on structural reforms um, and so on. The, uh, I only want to deal in this particular case with uh, Regulation 28. And now I'll leave the issues of the terms of borrowing from the uh, New Development Bank, the IMF World Bank, to DG and, and TP, so they will deal with that. But let me deal with what I meant by the Regulation 28 issue, uh, which I had mentioned at the press conference and it disappeared from my speech. During the course of the conversations, we had uh, come to the position where we thought that uh, in the Pensions Act, and the regulations that then support the Pensions Act, there's something called Regulation 28. Hmm? Yeah, Regulation 28. And Regulation 28 guides uh, pension funds and uh, such uh, institutions on their investment uh, behavior. And one of the things it says is whether you can invest in immovable uh, property or otherwise. Now, there's been a narrow definition from investment managers about how they deal with this regulation. And all that we wanted to say yesterday was that we should then say immovable in uh, property and infrastructure. That's all we wanted to do, to try and unlock in the minds of the investment managers that they can also invest a percentage of their investable funds in infrastructure in addition to immovable uh, property, but we would maintain the same 25% uh, threshold that, that was required. But the view of the financial sector regulatory authority is that we must wait a bit until they release a, a document, a policy document in that regard, which I hope they can do in the next six months. But the direction is what I tried to describe now. Honorable Mr. Vessels, uh, spoke about the wage bill and why we didn't say as much on the wage bill as maybe was expected. Fact of the matter is that the matter pertaining to the negotiations between the government and the public service unions went to the bargaining council. There was a deadlock there. It was agreed that the parties would go to arbitration. The matter went to arbitration. But the public, <clears throat> the public servants association chose to approach the labor court. And in their uh, documentation, they attached all other unions in the in the public service. So, but let's be clear, it's the Public Servants Association that has gone to the Labor Court. But in their documents, they also brought along with them the other unions in the public service. Now, now the other unions, you have to understand negotiations to understand this complex issue. The other unions say we have been brought to the Labour Court by the Public Service Association, but we are still in arbitration. Okay, So only the Public Service Association has gone to the Labour Court theoretically, or, or I don't know, legally, uh, whatever the case might be. So I prefer to leave the matters of the uh, the content of the uh, wage negotiations to the Minister of Public Service and Administration. I think he is better placed. He has a legal and uh, policy uh, uh, position uh, to deal with that. So can I leave that with, with him, please? The, uh, the issue of the SAA, that Mr. Vessels raised, Honorable Vessels raised. Uh, 
Again, the issues around the SAA are too complicated. And Minister uh, Gordon is better placed to deal with these issues. But to the extent that there are financial implications that are involved in this, let me say the following. In the February budget, we allocated an amount of 16.4 billion rand, which is the guarantees that were put in place for SAA, which will have to be met when the lenders call for the, the guarantee. That's unavoidable. What happens after that? It's a, on SAA and restructuring, and new airline and everything else. I can talk about that. That is the domain of Minister Gordon, and I'm, I think he's dealing with that. On the issue of the job creation fund that Mr. Vessels talks about, uh, I'll leave that to uh, DG to deal with, uh, but we do have an answer for it. Um, on slide 15, Honorable uh, Dennis, um, about cigarettes and so on. Again, I take the Fifth Amendment on that. I don't want to talk about that. I'll, I'll leave the, it to the responsible ministers to deal with that just in case I get into trouble. And Honorable uh, Yunus Karim always, always enjoys it when I get into trouble. So I don't want to give him any pleasure whatsoever uh, this evening. Uh, so, Minister, so cruel. But you always do. <laughs> no, 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 you see too much, my God. You always do. I was referring to the finance. But, but when we meet at the Royal Horse Guards Hotel in London, you're much nicer to me. Um, about, the land land bank, in about, revenue. The land bank, about the land bank, um, we are very committed to the revitalization of the land bank. Uh, that's why we have you know, creamed funds around to try and put a, a support package for the land bank of 3 billion rand, and we're committed to that. But the land bank management and the board of directors must work with us to create a genuine land bank that supports agriculture in South Africa. Um, and it's a case throughout uh, in our country, we must create institutions which support uh, this development and growth initiatives that we want to be involved in. Um, and then, uh, 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 Honorable uh, Peters, um, Honorable Peters, number eight, Honorable Peters, she is the debt service costs. We'll bring up a graph again to, to explain that. The wage bill I've spoken about, uh, the issue about the banks not honoring the uh, the, the payment holidays, uh, I'm happy you've made that point. We'll take it up with the banks because the impression that we've been given is that they are giving the, the holidays, but if they're not, they will take it up with them. You, you'll have seen my speech yesterday. I made reference to that. Uh, so if that's not the case, we'll pick it up with the, with the banking association. Uh, the issue of... Um, uh, the retirement age, whether it should be 55 or, or 60, I think is something that uh, um, uh, uh, can be looked at. I think that in the public service, uh, DG, you might correct me, we had agreed that uh, if you had reached the age of, I think, 55, you could take early retirement, then the rest of the arrangements could be made, but DG would We'll deal with that. Um, and indeed, there are many health workers who might want uh, to come and uh, uh, work in the health service, but also others who might want to retire early um, in the process. Finally, uh, let me 
este um, yeah the, the question from the DA uh, it's about the fiscal buffers again I have the answer to this but I'll leave it to DG and to Edgar to deal with uh, the primary balance commitment again I'll leave it to Edgar uh, the business rescue package for SAA I think I've I've dealt with the 16.4 billion and that the rest really is uh, should go to Minister Gordon. Uh, the job creation program of the presidency expanded public works program. Uh, Edgar will deal with that together with the active scenario. Um, uh, yeah, I think to the best of my ability, Chair, I, in terms of the notes, <laughs> I took copious notes and I, I've tried my best to answer, but maybe DG would like to uh, cover some of the points I didn't cover um, with your permission, sir. Yes, thank you very much. Over to you, DG, and your team. Just to remind Just members, to remind especially you, those you, from you, the you, provinces, that there seems to be an echo, Lubabala. Or I won't say anything right now because maybe there's something wrong on my side. DG, will you take over? Thank you very much, Chair. Um, I don't know if you can hear me. Chair, yeah, thank you very much, Minister, uh, You're for the fine. opportunity to respond to some of the questions. There was a question around uh, the conditionalities and uh, about the loans. Um, I must hasten to say, Chair, firstly, in engaging with the IMF, firstly, I think we should be clear, we are not going to be giving up any sovereignty, and we are not going to be giving to anything that will compromise the sovereignty of the state. What we are talking to the IMF, <clears throat> excuse me, IMF about, is about the agreement on broad things that we've agreed to in the past things that we as South Africa have committed to. And all that the IMF is doing is to ensure and check how far we are. I'll give an example. These are issues that we've raised in our own document, for instance, in the towards <clears throat> a growth, uh, uh, you know, to South Africa, the document that we issued last year, whereby we were talking about electricity. In there, we are saying what is being going to be done around the renewable program. When is window number five coming in? On digital migration, there are things that we've said and committed to. The question then becomes, what have we done? On transportation, we said, how do we quickly propose measures that will reduce cross subsidization? How far are you? When are you going to do it? On agriculture, there are some commitments that we made and suggestions that we said we want to come up with. So the key first question is going to be, how far are you and when are you going to do some of these things? So we don't see those as conditionalities, but we see those kind of reform package issues that we in the past ourselves as South Africa committed to. So those will, there'll be such conversations and such agreements that will make it easy. Secondly, the IMF expects us to have an MOU, for instance, between the Reserve Bank and ourselves. The Reserve Bank, obviously, the MOU, for instance, will talk to you around the receipts and the requests that we'll have to be making to the IMF on this, uh, the promissory note that we'll have to obviously agree that we will pay you the 4.2 billion back. And how we're going to service the repayment and because the money has to flow through the Reserve Bank. So one, call it a, an agreement that says we will sign an agreement with the Reserve Bank and this agreement will facilitate the disbursement of resources to and for the two institutions in repaying and getting the resources. And these are all some of the, call them safeguard policies that are in the IMF system, whereby we have to have certain uh, agreements between ourselves and the Reserve Bank to facilitate the transfer of money. So, in a nutshell, there are no conditionalities uh, uh, that that uh, structural adjustment program of the 70s that I think the minister spoke about. None of those things. 
The other broad thing and big thing that is, uh, was in our discussion with the IMF, which I regard as a make or break deal, that we have to demonstrate that debt will stabilize. That's in our interest, and we ensure that debt stabilizes at 87% of debt to GDP in 23-24. That's not a condition. It's something that we as South Africa committed ourselves to because as the graph indicates that Edgar showed and one of the slides, that debt was spiraling out of control. And then it was obviously going to be almost impossible to actually save for future generations. So these are not conditionalities, but a broad agreement. So in terms of the process, we will have to, as South Africa, the Minister of Finance and the Reserve Bank Governor, we will have to send a letter of intent to the IMF. And the letter of intent will, among many things, indicate the intention, what to use with the money, and, and et cetera, et cetera, in terms of a, a rapid finance instrument requirement. So we will be doing that. And once that letter of intent is sent through, after discussions that have been held, and obviously we're almost 95, 96% there, and the, the issue then will go to management of the IMF and finally to the board. And the money, once the board is approved, will take a few, uh, uh, you know, a few, a few days for the money to flow through. We still expect that the money should flow in the current financial year. With the World Bank, the World Bank will be closely watching what the IMF will be doing or what the IMF could, uh, you know, uh, you know, agreement we've reached the IMF, and then based on that, we then obviously will engage. We penciled in um, anything between a billion and two billion dollars uh, with, with the World Bank, and we hope those discussions will, will finalize also, and then money should flow before the end of the financial. Same as the a new development bank money has gone through. You con we confirmed last week, and you, there, there was a, a statement issued by the new development bank where the board of the development bank are approved to one billion dollars. Gigi? You're getting a bit fuzzy, I think, but at least to me. But I hope, uh, if it's also to others, Lubavalo, can you help with that? You sort of find, and then you're fading in and fading out. Yes. It's not your fault. Uh, they'll help you to be uh, more audible. Okay. So I will stop there. Some of my colleagues will, will come on. There's a whole lot of colleagues. There's, um, uh, you know, Tsepiso, Momoniat. There's Edgar and Mampo and Madi Jeng on, on, on staff on local government that she can talk to. Maybe let me ask uh, Chair uh, for Edgar to come in talking about the fiscal buffers and, 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 and the reform packages. Dun Duncan is also on the line. Maybe let's hear Duncan's voice, Chair. Duncan is the acting DDG for economic policy, talking about the reforms that Mr. Vessel was asking about. And then Edgar can then close once uh, Tepizu has started talking about some of the questions that you asked. Maybe Duncan can come in, Chair, with your permission. Maybe he's clearer. Yes, of course. It's very nice that you've got a bigger team than usual. I think we're very grateful for that. Okay, Duncan, over to you. Uh, thanks, uh, Chair, um, Minister, and Honorable Members. Uh, there were a few questions on the structural reform agenda and the, uh, the paper towards an economic growth uh, agenda for South Africa. Um, we've outlined again this year in Chapter 3 in the supplementary budget um, where we think government's uh, reform agenda should focus. We have also, um, we have also uh, been working quite closely with the economic cluster um, of the relevant economic departments in government in pursuit of implementing that agenda. Um, and then of course, our work internally in terms of uh, refining that agenda further um, is taking shape. And I think uh, we certainly highlight this in the, in the supplementary budget. Um, we would like to uh, deliver more of that work at the time of the, of the MTBPS. So what this chapter in particular has focused on are the issues around uh, lowering the cost of business, which remains a key concern of government, particularly around raising competitiveness. Duncan, uh, Duncan. Duncan. sorry about that. I keep getting yes. harassed. I'm doing work, actually. It's related to managing the meeting. I keep getting harassed by the staff to say that the TV people are. Ah, there you are. Okay, good. 
Yeah, thanks, Jay. As I was saying, the um, what we do, what we do stress in this document is that uh, we've highlighted some of the areas that we do think. Um, if implementation starts um, immediately, and in some areas we have moved, then we can certainly achieve the, the active uh, scenario that we've outlined. So I think in, in, in summary, um, the key issue here is that more on the reform agenda will be announced in October. It's a key part of our uh, messaging around fiscal sustainability and fiscal credib credibility. Uh, to the extent that we start uh, immediately on the implementation and we build on some of the successes over the last few months, the achievement of that active scenario and therefore the achievement of fiscal credibility is within our grasp. Um, and I think that is, the, that is the key message we want to leave uh, the, the honourable members with. Thank you, Mr. Peterson. Who's next, if you're done? Uh, no, uh, I want to... Yeah. Can I just supplement, if you if you allow me, what Duncan, yes, yes. What, what Duncan was saying uh, is very important um, uh, that we understand that structural reforms are not just the the purview, the function of the state alone. It's a it's a it's a joined up uh, system. The Government must provide the policy framework, the uh, commitments that government itself can do, for example, state-owned enterprises and so on. But also, what is it that the private sector can do? And other economic agents, be they trade unions, be they this or the other economic agent. And so that we don't think that structural reforms are just only for the for the state, and I think this is very important. Therefore, the work that uh, uh, Deputy Minister Dr. Masondo will have to do is mobilize the uh, partnerships within the state, but also mobilize the other economic agents in the private sector and the trade union movement and others. So I thought I should just say that so that it mustn't be Structural reforms are not just the function of the state. The state is a regulatory policy framework, and also that which the state owns, whatever its monopolies, ports, uh, harbors, whatever, it can do better, but mobilize also the private sector. So whether it's a manufacturing cycle, cycle rather, or the mi mining industry, the agri-SAA, and so on, um, agri-SAA, mobilize all of this into a common effort towards uh, building the economy. I thought I should say that just to supplement what Duncan is saying. Thank you very much. That's quite, that's quite useful. Over to the DG. Uh, who you want next, please? Chair, I would request Edgar to come on um, and talk about yeah. the fiscal buffers and primary balance. Okay. Um, Chair, can you... Uh, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, we want to see you as well, Edgar, please. Okay. Well, something's got, something's yeah. gone wrong with my lights. So it, All right, let me go for it. Oh, there you are. There you are. <laughs> okay. So um, firstly, on the question around the fiscal buffers, I think if you look at slide number seven, if you look at slide number seven of our um, presentation, uh, the now famous hippopotamus slide, it now begins to to give you a sense of what we're trying to say. And if you look at that slide, the question is, when did the structural gap, what we consider now a structural gap between government spending and government revenue really take hold? And um, it was really, I mean, at the beginning of the decade, in the period between 2010 and 2013, um, and into the middle of the decade, the structural gap began to appear and, and the buffers became uh, uh, weakened. And uh, they were weakened in a couple of ways. The first is that we began around that time to have a number of unaffordable wage agreements. So the increase in the wage bill was number one. Um, and the fact that you know, at the time when the state was negotiating on the wages, the state um, uh, was not successful in, in pulling that back. That's number one. The second thing that began to happen was um, the 
financial crisis of state-owned companies. When the financial crisis of these companies began to take hold, the number of guarantees rose uh, dramatically, um, and the number of, frankly, bailouts uh, also started coming into the system. Um, so from the spending side, you can see if you look at that, the, the, that sort of that line above, you can see how that line really began to, to set in place and refused to come back down. So those, th those are the two sort of big things that happened on the fiscal side that, um, that, that, that are, are, are a reason for why the buffers began to disappear. The second, uh, or the, the last one, of course, that was important was, um, and I mentioned this in my presentation, was a failure to restore economic growth. After the global financial crisis, we never went back to the levels of growth that we had in the previous decade. And in this regard, what that did was it created a problem for, the, for fiscal policy because fiscal policy making was for a number of years being made under the assumption that growth would return. You'd remember, uh, Mr. Chairman and honorable members, that uh, we started uh, from 2012 onwards putting in place spending ceilings, but the spending ceilings were predicated on a expectation of growth which did not materialize. So that would be my answer on why the fiscal buffers um, uh, went down. Um, with respect to the primary balance, I'm going to answer that question uh, in, in this, you know, I would sort of merge it together with the uh, issue of the active scenario um, that we have uh, put together. Um, just for everybody's, um, uh, to make sure everybody understands, the primary balance is the balance of, um, um, of the fiscal accounts minus the debt service costs. In other words, it's meant to reflect as a proxy the areas of fiscal policy that government is directly able to influence in the short term. Um, so you exclude the debt service cost and you take the revenue minus the non-interest expenditure and, and then you get the primary balance. And for the purposes of um, determining the active scenario, what we were targeting was achieving a primary balance in, in a particular year. In this case, we achieved it in 2023-24 because in that year was when we wanted to see debt stabilize. So if you, um, if you look at slide 27 in the presentation um, that we uh, gave um, this evening, that level of stabilization that you see there of 87.4% is the year in which we're able to achieve that primary, um, that primary surplus, a very small primary surplus, but sufficient for us to start turning the jet debt trajectory around in order to do that, and we make no bones about this in the budget review, we're very specific about what you need to do in order to get to that level. It's not going to happen by itself. You need to do three things. The first thing that you need to do is you need to start closing that gap, the hippopotamus in slide seven, by spending reductions. You need to do spending reductions. You need to start making government live within its means. The second thing you need to do is you need to consider improving the tax revenue of government. But much of the weight has to fall on spending. This will be important. And the last thing you have to do is you have to now implement the reforms necessary to achieve high levels of economic growth. Um, and uh, if we can do those three things, we can stabilize the, the fiscal accounts. We can achieve debt sustainability. And we can uh, produce uh, a, um, um, a, a conditions for for economic growth. Thank you. Okay, who's next, DG? Chair, thank you very much, Chair. Just to add, uh, many an analyst look at your primary balance as a barometer uh, to actually check on your debt sustainability and your ability to repay debt. So as we narrow the primary balance to a positive balance, then our debt's uh, ability to repay debt cannot be questionable. So it's one of the things that some analysts obviously look at. The next uh, uh, answer is from Mampoche. She's going to focus on the 100 billion rent question that came 
uh, uh, Dr. Murise can come on. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you, DG. Um, honorable members, my question is quite easy. So it's about the why we have not provided the details for the 100 billion of employment creations. We have been working with the presidency. So the proposals that they have put um, so far has two elements. The first element is the work that has to be done by um, the departments where they have already existing infrastructure to roll out the programs, but also the certain elements of what is new and um, we have to look at the institutional arrangements. So in terms of um, what the departments have to do or the existing roles that the department have, what we don't want to do is basically to have a situation where we continue to roll out programs that have not shown a uh, much efficiency in the state. So we're really looking at how can we redesign the existing projects so that we get more output with little input. So the reason why we have the allocation as provisional allocation in the budget is that this work is still going on. And when we looked at the projections, we realized that it's not possible for the state to spend 100 billion without having proper processes in place. That's why the minister has announced that this will be rolled out over the MTF. This is precisely because we have um, received a lot of criticism about the employment creation programs that we have as a state. So we're trying to fix those problems or those programs before we can basically increase the rollout of those projects. And then we also looked at the costing, whether is it efficient to do it um, through the institutions of the state vis-a-vis -vis, uh, doing it through the private sector. And we have identified certain elements that we think can be rolled out by the state, but we're also looking at the possibility of um, creating a fund that can be managed and where we can um, rob in some of the private sector expertise and assistance so that we can roll out more of this employment creation. So it's not that the detail um, doesn't exist, it's more of when we do come at MTBPS time, we announce something that is concrete, something that will have less criticism, but also something that we are comfortable as Treasury and the different departments that it will work and can be implemented um, as a phase-in approach. So basically in the MTBPS, we'll have more detail because most of the plans will be finalized and we will know how we're going to implement um, the different phases and the different segments of the um, 100 billion job creation. Thanks, DG and Chairperson. Did you Chair, come to now? The, the, the final set of questions will be Tepiso, Assets and Liability Management. Tepiso will essentially just touch on two critical issues. There's issues around local funding. And I wanted Chair Tepiso to also just talk to page 35 and page 36 of the budget review, where we're talking about the financing, the gross borrowing requirement. There are some, some, some critical information that I think is important to bring to the attention of the committee around how cash is managed and how we manage cash and how important it is that we obviously had to uh, come up with other new measures that actually are used as kind of your colleague call them reserve measures for now uh, in case of the challenges that we find ourselves in. And so Tepiso will talk about those kind of issues. Tepiso, please. Uh, thank you, DG. Thank you, honorable members. Um, I would like to respond to the question that was asked by Honorable Floyd, um, and he was asking whether we have exhausted all local funding to uh, before we even considered the IMF. Um, Honorable members, as you know, Economics 101, um, scarcity is the key issue here. And the if you look at South African savings, South Africa is not a saving country. Um, the annual growth saving rate about 14.5%. And that by its very nature constrains the amount that is available um, in the economy for investment. Just to give you a perspective, um, the assets under management in our country are not growing as fast as the government borrowing requirement. That is a fact. I did indicate earlier that in about three years, we have tripled our gross borrowing requirement. We used to borrow about 240 on average billion rands in a year. And that has in a very short period of time 
um, tripled to about 776 billion that we are seeing currently. And the local savings are not growing at the same rate. And in the past, to augment that saving, internal saving, we had relied on um, foreign investors who would come into the local market and buy bonds that we issue on a weekly basis. Um, just to give you a perspective, honorable member, every week, Treasury raises um, over 20 billion rands uh, in various instruments uh, to finance the budget deficit. And that is a significant number. And in considering whether the market can absorb uh, that amount of money, we look at what is available in terms of saving, what is available in terms of uh, the assets that they're managing. Uh, to give you a perspective, about nine, 10 trillion rands are managed by the nine bank financial sector. Um, about six trillion is within the banking sector. The nine bank financial sector honorable members consist of your long-term insurers, your short-term insurers, uh, your official and private pension funds and other finance companies. And those contributes to about almost 10 trillion. This money is invested in various um, instruments and those are regulated in terms of limits. Um, for example, just to give you a flavor, about 55% is invested in equities, about 30% in fixed income. And that is where government funds uh, mostly and about 6% um, is in cash and deposits, uh, which is mainly your money market uh, instruments. So while this asset under management is significant uh, in terms of the stock, when you look at the flow, which is how much it grows every year, that is very uh, small and it still has to be divided among these asset classes. So it means that when you look at government, it's not really enough that goes into a public sector. And even the amount that goes into the public sector, it means that it still has to be um, you know, portion between the government and other state-owned companies who rely on capital market. Um, sorry, to be intrude. Uh, sorry to intrude. I've just been contacted by phone by the ICT section. Mambu is asked not to share a screen with anybody because it's disrupting, it seems. Mambu, wherever you are, or well, you are somewhere in cyberspace, please don't share your screen. Thank you. Sorry, go ahead, please. Um, thank you, Honorable Chair. Um, so as I was indicating that... Um, you know, while there are, you know, huge amount of resources, um, they are already invested, they are not sitting under mattresses and there are limits to various instruments. Um, and therefore, when there is new requirement, one, it's either there has to be enough money that has been invested in terms of the growth for that particular year. Um, also, it would mean that there would be also a rotation from other asset classes um, to finance whatever new funding there is, and that could potentially crowd other investors who uh, might have, you know, been invested into. And the other consideration, especially during this time of COVID, is a perfect example of withdrawals from pension funds and provident fund, because people are not able to to deal with um, the challenge that is before them as a result of of COVID. So in essence, that the new money that we see that is being created in the economy, uh, it is not sufficient to cover the increasing uh, government borrowing requirement. And that is why, Honorable Member, we have uh, went on and looked at what buffers we have. Not significant, um, as Edgar had alluded to why we do not have such significant uh, buffers uh, during good times around 2004-2005 when Treasury was running uh, primary uh, surpluses and budget surpluses, it was able to put uh, certain amounts aside, but they are not that significant. I mean, in terms of local currency amounts, we're talking about 67 billion rands. And already this year, we are planning to access a significant amount of that. And if we look at the supply and demand in the local market, take into consideration the amount of buffers that we have to use, um, as well as the borrowing from alternative sources. Uh, we think that is the best combination uh, to be able to deal with this elevated uh, gross borrowing requirement. In the absence of that, Honorable Member Floyd, it would mean that the cost of borrowing, because you are supplying, uh, you know, supply and demand, you are oversupplying to the market what the market does not require. Basic economics will tell you that the pricing of that would be significantly higher 
and it speaks to the debt service cost that Honorable Dipur Peters was alluding to. And already debt service cost is one of the fastest growing expenditure items, which is eroding and crowding out um, other expenditure that could benefit um, the people of, of this country. So in thinking about how we finance, we tactically look at these issues and we tactically consider various um, sources of funding, one that are cheap, two, uh, sustainable, um, three, uh, ensure that we've got a very good mix um, such that the benchmark risks that we look at, whether it's currency, um, term to maturity, which is how instruments mature over a period, um, are also looked at. We pride ourselves, honorable member, with uh, members with very deep and liquid financial markets, and those are able, very sophisticated as well, um, comparable to developed countries. We can't even develop to uh, compare ourselves to our own peers because our financial markets is that developed. So all this is informed, and there's a lot of analysis and a lot of work that goes into uh, informing uh, how we think about these issues. Um, on the second point of repayment of debt and what are we exactly talking about? Honorable members, uh, that almost 4 trillion rand of debt is not grants. Nobody gives you money for free. You would know when you buy a car, a mortgage bond, every month you pay interest um, and some level of capital in terms of amortized instruments. So these loans that we borrow, as Minister articulated very clearly when he delivered the supplementary budget, they need to be serviced. So either quarterly, in our case, mostly is by annually where we service the interest. And at the end is what we call redemption or capital payment. At the end, if we borrowed two billion US dollars, uh, we would pay that two billion back. But every year for 10 years, if it's a 10 year instrument, um, every six months we would be paying interest. That is what debt service cost refers to. Um, and it includes both the interest and also the capital uh, that goes with it. And I think it's very important to know that the biggest driver of debt service cost, honorable members, it is the budget deficit. It is the amount of money that we borrow. Obviously, there are other factors that come in. For example, the interest rates that change, they are not stagnant. Uh, also, the currency composition. If you look at the exchange rate and you revalue the debt, it would also have impact. Inflation, as far as we issue inflation-linked instruments, um, if inflation is high, um, it implies that the debt would have to then be um, revalued at a higher level um, in terms of repayment. So the only way and the only control we have as a government is um, the level of debt. The rest are based on markets and others are based on the extent to which um, the risk premium associated with our country is viewed by others and they are able to then price it in and request that they be compensated for the risk that they take. So the message is there's no limitless uh, port of money that is available. Um, there are constraints and your level of credit very much determines uh, honorable members, what you are able to get. It's very similar to your own uh, balance sheet. If you go to the bank, you are able to get prime or prime less something because you are in good standing. And if you're not, you are going to pay prime plus, or you might even be rejected by banks and you might find yourself uh, having to get with these resources from Mashonisas who would then um, request that you very much overcompensate them for the risk that they are taking with you. It's no different from the sovereign um, and certainly uh, something that we worry about all the time and something that we are concerned about uh, for future generations, given the intergenerational equity principle that underpins our budget. So honorable members, as, as much as there's a sense that there is a lot of money in this country, um, it, it, is, it is the case, but it is deployed. And to the extent that we are able to access it and we are able to grow the economy, grow the savings of this country and make sure that we are able to deal with our affairs, unfortunately, we'll have to go and rely on some of these external savings uh, to be able to do what we need to do. 
honorable members. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair. Yeah, you come in, please. DM. Yes. Okay. Just to reinforce the, the point that uh, the minister made on Regulation 28, uh, the part that uh, you could not read in his speech, Regulation 28 is there to ensure that uh, the retirement funds are safe. They are, in other ways, they are deployed in such a way that uh, there will be good returns for the savers and it therefore guide the asset managers or money managers on where exactly should they deploy that money in percentage terms. So it will have different percentages to guide that you can invest in these assets. So the, the, the point there, which uh, the minister uh, was referring to, is that there is uh, a, a percentage of 25 which is categorized as immovable properties and that simply refers to, uh, you can't see me no we can okay thank you Maybe, Mr. We, can. we can can members generally see the dm okay should i come should closer I you're being managed by your department, I see. Okay. Am I visible? You most certainly are, to me at least. Right, go ahead, please. Cover principal, cover principal, you are visible. Oh, great. Uh, so the immovable property uh, has a 25% allocation. So, and the immovable property um, refers to properties for private consumption. It could be housing, it could be properties for business, malls and other properties. So the idea here is not to move above 25%. It's simply to say that 25% should include infrastructure assets. And by infrastructure assets here, yeah, refers to roads, basically public infrastructure, which is different from the immovable uh, properties. But like the minister has said, the, we will have to come back to you on this and want to assure the retirement funds that their funds are safe and there's no intention here to change the regulation in such a way that will sacrifice the returns and the safety of these retirement funds. I thought I should, I should add that and clarify. Now, the second point about the state bank. Again, the, the intention here is to consolidate a number of assets that are bank, quasi-banks, and some of the banks that we basically have, Itala, Post Bank, and consolidate them under a bank, which is, will be a deposit-taking bank, uh, and whose target, uh, at this stage, the way we're thinking about it, is that, uh, like I said, it must consolidate the different assets that we have, uh, which are like quasi-banks, and in that way, we will make sure that we reduce the expenditure on, on a number of entities that are there. So it's, it's part and parcel of consolidating what we already have. But we, we, we are also thinking in terms of the target, we're targeting what is usually called the missing middle, which are people they don't qualify for RDP houses, but they also don't qualify for bonds, when they, for mortgages, when they go to the banks, when their kids go to uh, institutions of higher learning, they don't qualify for uh, NEFSAs, but they also don't qualify for, uh, uh, for, for loans uh, from the banks. And again, we are also targeting SMMEs because the exposure 
of the banks in so far as the SMMEs, it's very low. So, however, we'll come back to you on, on, on as the minister has indicated on this. There is a process of, of put together, we will be presenting to cabinet what our views are as national treasury. And once that is concluded, we'll be able to come back to you and discuss uh, this issue, but also the banking sector uh, as a whole. The, the, the third point, I mean, there was a question about radical economic transformation structural reforms. I do not think that we need to counterpose uh, radical economic transformation, structural uh, reforms, because if you read our document, national treasure or government document, um, we're very clear that the precondition for growth is transformation. Because if you Let's take land as an example. In actual fact, the World Bank has made an observation that our economy is, is highly concentrated and it's a factor for economic growth. So if you take land as an example, if you are able to do land redistribution responsibly and uh, in a manner that it's economically sound, by way of distributing land to a number of people who can do farming, who can produce more food for economic growth. That's a necessary condition for uh, economic growth, because as long as certain assets are concentrated in few hands and they're underutilized, we will not have economic growth. In fact, the history of economic growth throughout the world it has been accompanied by serious economic transformation, including land. Yeah. Yeah, if, I'm if, sorry to, yeah. Yeah, can I just come in? We've got about 13 minutes left. There are three other questions to come, and there are several things that chairs have to do to round up. So can you remember, we're putting these issues on the agenda. So if you okay. could round up quickly in a minute or so, thank you. Okay, maybe let me leave there, because I also wanted to talk about this issue, the, the point that was raised about the printing money. Let me quickly go through it, if you allow me, Chair. That Look, you must respond to, but we've raised it before, and yeah. you're going to repeat the same thing, but do, because people are not listening. Oh, you want me to, to repeat? I, I can repeat it. Uh, say exactly the same thing that I've said before, and I don't know why the member is asking me. I, I agree, I agree, but I have no right to prevent people raising the same question repeatedly. Okay, should I repeat it again? Okay. Uh, repeat the answer uh, uh, in a very nifty, laconic way. Thank you. Okay. So the, the Reserve Bank sub, uh, prints money in order to supply it in the economy. The issue is under what condition does it do that and printing money for what? Our constitution is very clear that the Reserve Bank has to supply money in the economy in the interest of uh, price stability, uh, which is consistent with balanced economic growth. And they use different instruments to achieve that. And that's why in monetary economics, they, they, they distinguish between goal independence as well as the instrument independence of the Reserve Bank. The goal is not set by the Reserve Bank. The goal of the Reserve Bank is not set by the Reserve Bank itself. Actually, there is no independence of a Reserve Bank or a central bank anywhere in the, wo in the world. It's a myth. All the goals of central banks are set constitutionally or by government or both. In our case, the goal of the Reserve Bank is clearly articulated in our constitution, which is further clarified by government. In this instance, as government, we've set the goal of the Reserve Bank from the point of view of inflation, that it should be between 3% to 6%. That's the goal. The instruments that they use range from interest rates, which is part of and parcel of supplying money into, into the economy. The Reserve Bank in, the, in, in, in making sure that uh, the banks, they comply with the prudential requirement 
there's capital adequacy ratios which are set by the bank as part and parcel of their instrument to supply money. They also buy bonds. They've been buying bonds since the impact of COVID in the secondary uh, market. So they do exercise their instrument independence as a bank. And the, the, the goal is very clear that the yeah. balance yeah. growth. So I think, uh, and, and the, the, the bank is very clear. If you read their financial stability review, they've said under these conditions, and I quote, the Reserve Bank stands ready to take additional action should the need arise. So I do not think that uh, it's correct even for the member to argue that, no, they must not print money. If they decide to do so as part of their in instrument independent, they should be allowed to do so. So I do not think that... Uh, I, yeah, thank you very much. Yeah. 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 Thank you, Chair. Okay. Thank you, DG Minister. I'm afraid we're at 8.51. There are three more questions. There's still three minutes owed to me and the co-chair, which we're entitled to. But I'm going to allow... Can I please first make some announcements? Comrade Joe, we have to do this. Firstly... Uh, uh, for those who are here from the provinces as part of this virtual meeting, uh, you need to be reminded that next Friday at the very same slot, 6 p.m. to 9 p.m., the Treasury comes back. They will respond to outstanding questions that haven't been addressed today. Any questions, put them in writing in the meanwhile. The responses of the PBO and the FFC next Tuesday and civil society and stakeholders for the public at the public hearing. So we get a second bite at them. Now, there's Dennis who was in a meeting elsewhere. So I'll give him one minute, I'm afraid, Dennis. And only a specific question from uh, it's Floyd and Dion. And then I'll do my three minutes and hand over to Joe, uh, to, to Joe and Dick Lady if they've got things to say. And then the co-chair will draw the meeting to a close. So Dennis, I'm going I've, to be- I raised my hand, Chairperson. One, sorry? I What's raised that? my hand as well. No, I included you. Your name is uh, Jordan, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, Dion. Yeah, yeah. yeah. in order of, of uh, Dennis must come first. And it's Floyd who had his hand up first, and then Jordan. Uh, and let me be clear, Lubabalo, can you mute them at the end of one and a half minutes? Just mute them, because really, uh, we've got problems about getting more than five. We can go up till 9.10 oh, at the nine ten at the latest, and we've got next week three sittings. We can take things further. Okay, over to you, Dennis. I'm, I'm monitoring you. You can monitor yourself as well. But right, go for it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chair. Thanks for what? indulging what? me. As you said, I had <laughs> other commitments. I appreciate you giving me the gap. Um, really, I just want to ask a question about sentiment. So obviously, the, uh, the, the current account deficit is going to be superficially affected by uh, the lockdown situation. But can we have an indication of what the current account deficit is looking like at the moment so we can gauge uh, sentiment, certainly in, in, in terms of, of, of foreign investment as well? Um, and linked to that, but not entirely the same, what is the state of bond sales since the downgrade? So specifically since the Moody's downgrade, um, you know, in terms of yields and subscription, uh, you know, perhaps excluding the Saab purchase, uh, what, what has been the situation with uh, government bonds in the interim? Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Floyd. One and a half minutes, please. No more, to be fair. No, thanks, Chair. It's almost a year since uh, the minister committed on assigning the deputy minister of the state bank. And it looks like he's coming. Can we get a time as the committee where we're going to be given a clear plan of what would be this state bank so that we can give our clearly about African bank being the nucleus of that uh, state-owned bank? The, the second issue that I want to raise uh, quickly, Chair, is where does National Treasury get this thing that the uh, budget to contain uh, the debt crisis? Like, where does it come from? Because all scientific theory, even the orthodox, are now coming to rationality through science that there has never been a coming in that comes through authority measure. And then lastly, and then lastly quickly, Chair, the deputy minister is assigned to implement or coordinate the structural reforms. What exactly is this going to do? There is no limit uh, the spectrum in terms of the water plan, in terms of irrigation system, about a variety of things. What exactly is it going to implement when there's no agreement even in cabinet about this so-called structural reform? What exactly is it going to do? Thanks. You were 30.
Yes, we lost you now and then, but I think uh, the questions are reasonably clear. Jordan, one and a half minutes, thanks. Thank you very much. Just as we've been sitting here, Moody's Investor Services has released a note in response to yesterday's budget in which they say that it's unlikely that debt stabilization is to be achieved by 2023. And it goes to the question I asked earlier about the likelihood of the active uh, path, the, the narrow gates that the minister quoted from from the Bible. Uh, the, the answer, you know, try to again make a case for why that is uh, necessary. We know it's necessary. What I want to know is, does the minister concede that it is not likely? It, it cannot be considered the base case when such little progress has been made on economic reform uh, to date. I also think that there was a cop out on, on fiscal buffers. It is ultimately the Treasury that is accountable for the country's finances. And if we came into this crisis with inadequate fiscal buffers, it is the Treasury and the Minister of the Treasury, the Minister of Finance, who must uh, be accountable for that. Uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll just push him on the cabinet commitment. I, I, I want to know, is there a firm, irrevocable, cast in stone, at all costs commitment that we will achieve debt stabilization by 2023? Or is it just a wish, a hope, a best effort? Thank you. Thanks, Jordan. Minister and your team, two minutes each, please. I think we should round up from the Treasury side, Minister, with due respect, within five minutes, six minutes maximum. We can spill over slightly about nine o'clock, and then the chairs need to draw it to a close. Over to you, Minister, and your team. Uh, <clears throat> no, thank you very much, uh, Honorable Mem uh, uh, Chair. I, I, I think the rest maybe we could also discuss later, but let me just quickly go to... Um, uh, Honourable, um, is it Dennis, um, about the uh, balance of payment situation? I think uh, unless if my unless Duncan, who is the chief economist at the National Treasury, has got the latest data, it's obvious that with the uh, um, problems of uh, import and export flows in the COVID situation the balance of payment situations will be slightly different. But we know that uh, the oil price has been down. The exchange rate has been acting as some kind of automatic stabilizer in the, in the situation. Inflation is down. So you could you know, have a, an educated guess about what the likely outcome is on the current uh, account balance. But as a Minister of Finance, I think I should avoid saying anything about that. On the bond sales, uh, Tepiso could come back for one second just to give us the numbers. Um, on the Moody's statement, I do expect Moody's to express a view about what we said yesterday and uh, we'll you know, have a conversation with them, debate with them and hear what their views are. Is there a cabinet commitment to debt stabilization? The answer is yes, there is. Otherwise, the Minister of Finance, you know, who has taken an oath of office, will not stand up in Parliament yesterday and say that these are the commitments which we are making. Otherwise, you know, I could as well be arrested or not have honoured my oath of office. I said so on behalf of my colleagues not on behalf of myself and my goats and sheep and chickens at home, but on behalf of the executive, the national executive. So the commitment is there. What would it take? And this is a difficult part. It will take the efforts of all of us, not just the Minister of Finance, not just the Treasury, but all of us to bring down our expenditure patterns, including cell phone allowances in parliament, if there are any, they have to come down. We have to understand that we are no longer as rich as we used to think we are, and, and, and therefore be able to move forward. The situation has changed. The, 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 the sword of Democritus, which I've spoken about before, has fallen on us. So I'm very clear about what needs to be done. For my part, as uh, the executive authority for the National Treasury, um, I'll, I'll do my best to ensure that the President of the Republic supports me 
and the DG of the National Treasury and other directors general and other ministers to have a common understanding about where we should go. I am confident that we can do it and we'll do it. We have overcome apartheid. You know, when the UDF was formed, nobody thought that the UDF could mobilize so many people against apartheid. Why can't we mobilize everybody else against this debt and this sovereign crisis? We're, we're going to do it. I'm quite convinced about it. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, do you guys want to come in, uh, your team? DG? Sure. No. Come through on the bond sales, if it's okay. Please, quickly, briefly. Thank you very much. Um, Chair, I think if you compare the bond uh, prices or yields um, as at the end of um, January to, to now, um, certainly very elevated. Uh, the local currency bonds, the um, foreign currency bonds that we find in, um, the yields have increased significantly. Um, and we see that uh, broadly or across all maturities and even more pronounced on the on the longer term maturities because of the risk embedded um, in the uncertainty as you go far out. So certainly, honorable member, the yields have gone up. They have come down slightly relative to when Moody's downgraded the sovereign. I, I suppose it was a shock and the market had to absorb that. To date, we have seen about 58 or so billion rands of outflows uh, from non-residents who participate in our local um, bonds uh, auctions. Um, and that has impact also in terms of where the yields would go. If you have uh, less demand and high supply, um, the price um, then is likely to, to be reflected um, as, uh, in, on, on the yields by you know, increased um, level of, of yields. So that is the situation right now. There has been some correction, but the correction is not anywhere, uh, honorable members, near uh, the yields that we saw um, at the end of January and just before um, the COVID uncertainty and volatility um, that we've, we've, we have witnessed. The sub has helped a lot, especially in the secondary market liquidity um, and ensuring that there is no dislocation um, in the in the market by purchasing bonds in the in the secondary market, and that has stabilized um, quite a lot. The ease of trading bonds has also improved as a result of that increased liquidity, and we have seen a better pricing uh, of this instrument um, as a result, but still relatively high. Uh, I'm not sure whether we'll get back to the uh, you know January end of January levels uh, at this rate. Uh, but we shall see as you know the risks um, are being absorbed. There are two things that drive this. Uh, global risks and a global search for yield has a very great impact um, in terms of um, how these yields behave, but also the idiosyncratic factors that are most uh, relevant to South Africa would also drive um, these yields and, and give an indication uh, of how the market perceived the risk um, associated uh, with this instrument. Um, in terms of subscription, honorable members, it, it varies from auction to auction and uh, definitely at the height of uh, this uh, crisis and also on the back of Moody's downgrade, uh, we did see um, an impact in the subscription rate, i.e. what we are looking for relative to how much the market comes to auction uh, was relatively small, but it has since improved and depending on what is driving the market that week, uh, you might see two times uh, subscription or three times. Uh, but if you compare with the previous trends when things were good, uh, obviously the subscription rates would be uh, relatively high to, to what we see. But there are also those investors who naturally would not care about the ratings or uh, where, where the yields are, but they're just worried about being able to make a quick buck, and they usually refer to as hedge funds. Um, they are not long-term money investors. They don't take a long-term view on the country. They come in, they make a buck, they get out. Uh, and in terms of evaluating the quality of your investor base, it is always better to have people who are going to be with you for a long while and who are going to support you through thick and thin, and those and not those who just want to come in and make a quick buck and leave. And as you ratings deteriorate, um, it means that you also start to attract machonisas as opposed to 
a group, good grade um, lenders, and those uh, are looking to make money very quickly. Um, and if you do not um, comply, they will have to then do whatever they need to do. Uh, most of the crisis that we've seen in emerging markets, whether it's Argentina, if you look at the holdouts in most of this debt restructure, would be entities like hedge funds because they're not there to to make value over time. They're there to make money. So it's important that as we consider these investors, we also consider the quality yeah. of investors well, yeah. we, we yeah. attract. Um, I'll stop there, um, Honorable Chair. Thank yeah. you very much. Gigi, do you want to say anything or anybody else? Quickly, please. No, I think the culture is that after the minister has spoken, it's, it's, it's done. It's done. Oh, I thought they were answering specific questions. I don't know if that oh, I, I think we've answered all the questions. Okay, right. So then we're going to move on to the next phase uh, from next week, Tuesday onwards. Uh, there's uh, the program before all committee members. Presumably, Libabali will send it out to the provincial secretaries, um, and the provincial legislatures, and so on. But before I hand over to the uh, uh, co chair person, obviously, I'm not just a timekeeper. I'm entitled to three minutes. So the first point I'd like to make, and I'm monitoring myself, Lubabala, will you stop me at three minutes? Uh, if you can monitor me, yeah, I go. Firstly, uh, Minister, uh, you know, I can't resist thinking aloud on this, right? And uh, there's no reply required particularly, but I wonder, you know, as I heard you speak, whether if you knew that we're going to have COVID-19 hitting us in 2020, whether you would have accepted the post of Minister of Finance. Right. But it's about a, a, a lighthearted comment, but also a serious one. In other words, I think you as a minister of finance and your team, the Treasury, is in an extremely unenviable position, unprecedented. There's no guidebook for it and so on. And what I'd like to say is offer my subjective empathy, if you like, and suggest to the uh, committee that, you know, whatever our differences may be on policy and how we should recover and so on, I, I think Treasury is doing quite well. And I'm particularly impressed, Chief, uh, Minister and colleagues, at the new faces you've brought on today, the young people that are emerging in Treasury, the greater variety of faces, there's still need for gender improvement, but there are a whole lot of new faces since 2014, as Dick Lady and others will confirm, that have been brought here. And we thank you and the DG for that, your expanded team. On the issue very quickly of the IMF, our committees have both said, that we are not opposed in principle in the exceptional circumstances we're in. We've, we also have to repeat, we've said, and yes, of course, the conditionalities, GG, of the 1970s don't subsist now, but we're concerned about other new conditionalities that are in the current context that might surface. So far, there's no sign that the Treasury is deviating from a commitment that there will be no substantial conditionalities. But I think what we're saying is that there's need for maximum openness and transparency that our concern about dollar-denominated uh, loans obviously need to be spelled out in exchanges with the Treasury and yourself, Minister. On the State Bank, I fully agree. I hope the coach agrees. We should put that on the agenda. Two parties in this parliament want that, and I welcome the progress in that regard. Also, to just draw attention to members that it's very useful to speak of a supplementary budget colloquially. I'm at 2.12. I've got how many seconds left? About uh, 40. Uh, it's correct to speak of a couple of a supplementary budget colloquially. It's simple, it's sort of evocative, it communicates to the public. But in terms of the law, PFMA and the money bills, that colleagues just remember it's an adjustment uh, 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 budget. And we can have more than one adjustment budget in a year. I've checked with Frank Jenkins and the, Frank Jenkins and the parliamentary legal services, and they confirm that you can call this an adjustment budget or a special adjustment budget if you like. But that's a term we'll use formally in our reports, except when we speak, we will speak of it. Finally, I would like, as many of us, indeed the minister himself, uh, a clearer economic framework within which much of this is located. Yes, the elements there in the national treasuries uh, and cabinet subsequently approved uh, a position on this, but we would like more of that. And hopefully that will become clearer yet in the new circumstances I'm in three minutes. And finally to say, that members, we need to think again and again about the way we run our committee meetings. Uh, some of us have tried to shift from this, what I call shopping list, where a series of questions are asked, the executive replies, and then lists hanging in the air. We need to cluster questions and a more thematic approach and, and so on, so that we can focus on particular issues and avoid repeating 
questions asked before. I have repeatedly, I've tried as a chair, uh, Comrade Joe, and failed because, especially in bigger meetings, members don't like that. They all want to have their say, which is also understandable. But we need to review the way we manage this sort of process. And I hand over now to you, Comrade Joe. We've got about another five, six minutes left. And maybe declare wants to say, thank you. Thank you, Minister. You are very specific in your replies, whatever anybody else said. And the undertones that didn't exist now don't exist in what I said. OK, so shall we move on? Thank you indeed. Uh, uh, thanks very much, uh, Chairperson, uh, Honorable Karim. Uh, what I would also want to say is that uh, you will remember that uh, last time we discussed uh, the economic recovery plan, of which the minister indicated that the cabinet is still working on it. We we'll have to come back to the economic reconstruction uh, post the lockdown, and the minister should indicate as to when will that uh, economic uh, recovery plan will be available for the parliament to be briefed about. So the recovery plan and what we are discussing today are intertwined because for that plan to survive, it has to be uh, funded by the budget. So at the right time, Minister, you will indicate your readiness and the parliament will be available to listen to you. And I will also request Minister that uh, there is uh, a cry from uh, SMEs for their invoices to be paid in time. If uh, I know that uh, they are supposed to be paid within uh, 30 days, so if uh, the uh, departments can stick to uh, the 30-day uh, period, mm -hmm. because uh, at the time in which we find ourselves, uh, most of the SMEs are finding it very, very difficult to survive. And government is the biggest procurer of services in the country. So government intervention is very important at this critical time. Let me outline the process uh, from now moving forward. Uh, the budget has been introduced yesterday by the minister. Uh, the speaker of uh, parliament has referred the budget and uh, all the accompanying uh, bills. Uh, to the committees. Uh, on the 8th of July, we are having to, uh, we are going to have a consideration of the revised fiscal framework. On the 15th of July, uh, the National Assembly uh, will consider the division of revenue. Uh, on the 22nd of July, the NCOP will uh, consider the division of revenue. And then uh, from there, uh, the budget will be referred to the NA committees. From the 21st to the 24th of July, uh, there will be mini plenaries in the National Assembly, which will be held uh, from uh, every Tuesday until uh, uh, eh? it will be from Tuesday until uh, Friday. That is the 21st to the 24th. So uh, it will be every day from Tuesday until uh, Friday. It's quite a very tight schedule. On the 29th of uh, July, uh, NA will consider the adjustments, uh, 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 amendment appropriate, I mean, uh, adjustment appropriation. No, 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 no. Consider, NA consideration of adjustment appropriation on the 29th of July. And uh, adjustment appropriation bill can only be referred to committees after the 8th of July. That is after the adoption of the fiscal framework. So that is the process from yesterday until the time uh, all the votes will have been uh, 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 passed by Parliament. So that is the process. Uh, let me thank you, uh, 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 Chairperson, and uh, thank other chairpersons of uh, committees of NCOP and NA. Thank members of the NA and uh, NCOP, uh, chairpersons of uh, provincial legislatures uh, responsible for finance, the minister, the deputy minister, uh, the DG and his uh, uh, technical staff or his team, the staff of parliament, 
media in lopu yaina siabulela roriwa baya danke the meeting is officially adjourned thanks thank you chair thank you komo dogo de lo maso thank you thank you baya danke akbare baya danke akbare danke danke baya danke baya danke Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair.